doing final preparations for our time together this morning, I started reminiscing. I started thinking about when I was in the position you're in. I'm sitting out there and somebody else is preaching. And I recall being a new Christian and the preacher would get up there and say, okay, I'm a I'm going to reference Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. And so I knew such little about Scripture. I had a Bible that looked exactly like this one. And so I actually got the table of contents. Y'all ever use the contents in your Bibles? I mean, that's, that's where I was in my journey. And I looked, okay, Galatians is on page 1247 in my Bible, and here I go. And by the time I got to page 1247, he had already quoted two or three more Scriptures. And I was way, way behind and uh, I was so eager to learn. I wanted to take everything in, but he was going so fast. Maybe everybody, everybody else could keep up and knew what he was talking about, but I found it a bit of a challenge. We are working through the gospel of Luke. And one of the things that I'm going to commit to each week, we're going to spend time predominantly in one passage in Luke. So you may have a rich understanding and a great background in the gospels. And so I hope the time that we have on Sunday morning enhances and, and helps you to have at the heart level an even greater appreciation. But if you're like I was during that time period I'm describing and you're having to look, oh, Luke chapter 6, what page is that on? We're going to stay in one passage and literally camp out there. And I hope that it'll be a special benefit to you. A place for you is the theme in Luke's gospel. There is a statement that Jesus makes in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, and he says, why? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? How many of you have been present just right before someone is going to be baptized into Jesus Christ? Have y'all been there? And what do we typically say? right before we're going to immerse someone in the waters of baptism, someone will ask the person who is going to do the baptizing, will say, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And someone will make that public confession. Yes, I do. And I always follow that question by saying, do you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life? And someone again answers in the affirmative. And I'm wondering, as I think about this passage and I, as I think about those scenarios where someone, in some cases, stand in front of the higher, entire church and say, well, yes, I want him to be the Lord of my life. And the question I have is, Lord, with a big, big question mark, do we have any inkling what the term means? I, I don't think that's a term that we use very frequently in our everyday conversation. In fact, in some ways, there may be even some negative connotations. If I went home this afternoon after church and told my family, I am the Lord of my house. <laughs> now, how do you think that's going to go over? I think you have a pretty good inkling of how that's going to go over if I go home and say, I am the Lord of my house. But the term is really significant, not a term, again, that we use in common conversation, but it's a very important term. It suggests the idea he is master. That means he is in control. He is master. It's a, it's a term that could be used as an owner. If you think about the time period in the New Testament when slavery was very common, he is the owner. He owns me. So for me to stand before people and say, I want Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life, what I'm saying is, I want him to be my master. I want him to own my very life. He has dominion. I am giving up dominion. I am choosing on purpose to give up the dominion and let him rule. He is going to rule over the person who is the Lord. Jesus is Lord. He rules. I'm going to give up that rule. Love, love this quote that I read Then someone who is commenting on the gospel of Luke. Today, many church attenders listen to God's word the way they listen to a flight attendant explaining aircraft safety features. Okay, you got to be honest now. You're on a flight and you're going somewhere and you're eager to get there. And the flight attendant gets up, has that little chart and starts explaining everything. And if you fly on Southwest, sometimes they even have a, a pretty good comical approach to using the safety features. And, uh, and everybody, you're paying close attention, aren't you? 
Are you sitting up in your seat and paying attention to every, just literally hanging on that flight attendant's words? I know you are. So here she is. She's the flight attendant who is explaining everything. She has her, her little chart here. And so this person who is describing how we listen to God's word the way we listen to the safety features on a plane also says this. One flight attendant, exasperated by the inattention, altered the wording to the safety features to say, quote, when the mass drops, place it over your navel and continue to breathe normally. And no one noticed. That's the extent to which people on that aircraft were paying attention to the safety message and and what you need to do if the mast happened to drop. I uh, was intrigued by the story of Southwest Airlines 1380. In April of 2018, Flight 1380 made an emergency landing in Philadelphia. I, I heard about it on the news and the, the reference somewhat. I don't recall if it was a, um, an air traffic controller or somebody actually on the flight. But in referring to Captain Tammy Jo Schultz, they said this woman, this pilot of this airline, of this aircraft, has nerves of steel. And I actually listened on YouTube to the dialogue that she had back and forth between the air traffic controller in Philadelphia, and she was as calm as a cucumber. You cannot imagine how calm she was. So I was intrigued enough. I read her autobiography, which is entitled Nerves of Steel. She was actually a naval pilot. So it's a great autobiography, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. She is a person of faith. So here's what happened on that flight in the spring of 2018. With no apparent warning, the plane's left engine exploded after one of its fan blades broke off. Oxygen mass dropped down and the plane plunged thousands of feet in a minute. Over the next 20 minutes, the depressurized cabin air swirled with wind and debris, panic and prayers as the pilot rerouted the plane to Philadelphia for an emergency landing. Suddenly, the safety lecture is not so irrelevant. I'm wondering this morning, How well are we, how well do we do at listening? And furthermore, I wonder if it takes some kind of personal crisis for the Word of God to have our full and complete attention. Are we just sort of like listening? Is is the person made that comparison? We're kind of like listening to the flight attendant. Yeah, 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 I've heard that before. I've been there before, I've heard this, yes, 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 until something, something significant takes place in our lives. And suddenly, we sit up in our chair and the Word of God most definitely has our full and complete attention. Jesus, in the text that we're going to read today, not just verse 46 where he asks them, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? He's going to go on and tell a parable, and it's a very vivid parable. And in essence, what the parable is doing is calling on us to pay attention and to respond accordingly. Luke 6, 46 through 49. Why do you call me, Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. I recall when we were making preparations to build our new building. It's fascinating to watch it go up, but it was particularly fascinating 
at all the preparation work that went into getting this foundation ready long before they ever poured any concrete. Load after load of good fill dirt coming in, doing all kinds of preparation work. But of even greater interest, as we think about Jesus telling this parable, let's hear this parable through the ears of the original hearers. So it might be helpful for us to have a somewhat of an appreciation for what it was like to build a very simple house in Palestine during the time period of Jesus. So here's a little background. In Palestine, in the summer, many of the rivers dried up altogether and left a sandy riverbed empty of water. But in winter, after the September rains had come, the empty riverbed became a raging torrent. Now, many a man looking for a site for a house found an inviting stretch of sand and built there only to discover when winter came he had built his house in the middle of a raging river which swept the house away. But the wise man searched for rock where it was more difficult to build and where it was hard labor to cut out the foundations. But when the wild winter weather came, his toil was amply repaid for his house stood strong and firm and secure. In either form, the parable teaches us the importance of laying the right foundation for life. The only foundation for life is obedience to the teaching of Jesus. What kind of foundation are you laying? When your kids were growing up, did you sing them song, The Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock? I asked the climbers class this morning, should I sing that to everybody? There was a resounding response. I got these, no, don't, please don't do that. Please, please spare us. So I'll spare you of singing, the wise man built his house upon the rock. So when it comes to the word of God, let's think about listening. Let's think about how we hear. When it comes to the word of God, here's a reality. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge is not sufficient. Now, get ready. I'm going to step on your toes this morning. I'm going to plow over like a bulldozer this morning because this is going to apply to a lot of us, especially for those who have a good, rich history in church all of your life. Knowledge for the sake of knowledge is not sufficient. It's the equivalent of building on the ground without a foundation. If you cease there, you, you want to know Scripture just for the sake of knowing Scripture, and you stop there, it most definitely is the equivalent of building on the ground without a foundation. So we hear these references, oh, he knows the Scripture. Oh, oh he, know, he has this, all this knowledge. He knows the Scripture. Well, how sweet. I'm so glad he does. He knows the Scripture. Or we'll say, Oh, she can quote the Bible. Oh, she can quote the Bible. Well, that's great. You can know the scripture and you can quote the Bible, but that is still not sufficient. So when we think about that, when the word of God, knowledge for the sake of knowledge is not sufficient. If there's no heartfelt application, if it's not speaking to our unique situations in life, if it's not molding us and shaping us into the people whom God expects us to be. So what we have all this knowledge? I, I think of the, the statement that Paul made to the church at Corinth. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And then I think when it comes to the word of God, if you're bored, it's time to examine your heart. You know, here's what I hear periodically. Well, they just spend way too much in the Bible. I, I'd like to hear something that's relevant to my life. I'm serious. I've heard that with some frequency. There's way too much time spent in the Bible. I need to hear something that's relevant to my life. So if that's where you're coming from, I would just say, okay, if you're bored, if, if spending time in Scripture you find boring, just, just pause for a moment, put on the brakes, and think, and do a little self-examination and examine your heart. Where, where are you coming from, and why are you bored? And I'm wondering, too, is listening to God a source 
of joy for you, something you anticipate, something you look forward to. You can't wait, can't wait to have an opportunity to reflect on Scripture and to listen to God and what does He have to say to my life and, and how is He shaping my life and where is my life going and can I experience such joy? In Psalm 119, it is just one of the Psalms that's just filled with the joy of someone who is relishing the experience of being immersed in the Word of God. And a little Bible trivia, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in Scripture. It's going to take you a little while to work through it if you want to read Psalm 119. But I just want to look at just a couple of verses here in verses 14 through 16. The psalmist says, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. And then he says, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. And then he uses the term delight. I delight in your, uh, in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. So two really key words here, the word rejoice and the word delight. Is, is that our mindset? Is, is it a source of real joy and a source of delight? It's filling. It's meaningful. It's something that you most definitely look forward to. If so if we're going to talk about application that knowledge for the sake of knowledge is not sufficient, then I think it's most appropriate for us to just pause for a moment and say, okay, then if that's true, what are the appropriate takeaways from this particular parable? The question I would ask, are you practicing selective listening? You know, I'd like to think I'm a good listener. But I'm fully convinced I'm selective in my listening. I, I have this uncanny ability to change the channel. Are you a good channel changer? If there's some kind of phrase like taking out the trash, uh, suddenly I changed the channel. I didn't hear that. I, I, I didn't hear that at all. If there is reference to Bluebell ice cream, all of a sudden my radar goes up. I heard everything. I heard every last word. And we're very, very selective in our listening. And I believe that can be true of the Scripture. It's easy to pass over the parts of Scripture that, that are especially difficult or they speak to our lives in a way that really causes us to cringe and think, Ooh, I don't know about that. I think I'll just conveniently pass that over and I'll practice a little selective listening. So I have a confession to make. Early on, again, I was a new Christian. I remember visiting a congregation with some fellow students, and I was a college student. And we went out to this little country church, and I remember sitting there thinking, you know, I'm, I'm no expert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm the guy that has to look up Galatians in the table of contents. But I'm sitting out there thinking, you know, this preacher, I do believe he is dry as sawdust itself. That's how I felt. Man, he is some kind of dry. And then I had this epiphany. Now, Bear in mind, I was probably in my early 20s, and if you recall, I don't know what you were like in your early 20s. When I was in my early 20s, I knew everything about most all subjects. You know, I was an authority on a lot of different subjects. How about you? Y'all authority on all subjects? You know, even into my, well into my 20s in graduate school, 23, 24, still was an authority on lots and lots of subjects. But I had this epiphany. I think it was a spirit-led epiphany. It occurred to me, even as I sat there thinking that this preacher is dry as sawdust itself, and I remember thinking, if he's preaching from the Word, the least I could do would be open my Bible, and he's in Luke chapter 6. Well, I could read Luke chapter 6, and certainly there's something I could glean from Luke chapter 6. There's got to be something helpful, something that would speak to my life, even if his presentation, or I should say the way I perceived his presentation is dry as sawdust. I will say, I've repented of how I thought about that poor guy many, many times. I'm sure he wasn't nearly as dry as I thought. And here's, a, here's another thought. We may look at, hear a lesson or read a passage and we'll think, you know, my brother-in-law sure needs to hear that, right? I have a crazy uncle that needs to hear that. And we just have this way of, in the process of selective hearing, of bypassing how it speaks to our heart, bypassing and quickly focusing all of our energies on taking the speck out of our brother's eye and ignoring the plank in our own eye. 
Or here's what I'll hear as those of us who do ministry, some of them will say, and it has to be said in the most pious of tones. I'm just not being fed. It has to be said just like that. It has to sound real spiritual. I'm just not being fed. And someone told me, you know, don't, don't take that personally. Your appropriate response to that person is, oh, I'm sorry. I thought as a Christian that you were mature enough to feed yourself. I've never told anybody that. I'm tempted. I may next time, so get ready. I may do it next time. I'm really tempted. I'm not being fed. So one takeaway of the parable is you really are responsible for feeding yourself and finding some spiritual substance in the manner in which God is speaking to your life. Are you practice selective listening? And there's no doubt that true hearing of the word requires both reflection and application. So as we think about reflection in particular, how well do you retain information? I'm going to tell you, when it comes to retaining information, I get an F minus. Did you know that such a thing as an F minus even existed? I get an F minus for retention. So what I have to do, since I know that I don't retain information well, since I know that I have the attention span of a gnat, I have to realize I have to work at it really, really hard. And so in order for me to retain information, I generally have to read it several times. And secondly, it's helpful for me to write things down. So I journal like you cannot imagine, because if I write things down and I go back and look at it the next day or maybe go back and look at it two weeks later, I'm far more likely to retain that information than if I just take it in one time. And, you know, there are people, our middle son can read something or hear something, and he has it, and it's memorized, and he'll rattle it right back to you. Uh, that did not come from my genes. Uh, that was some kind of genetic mutation, I guess. But... I really struggled to retain information. I saw this quote this week. As someone was, was thinking about this passage, he says, ours is a non-reflective age. Do you think that's true? Do you think we're in a time, our culture, the time that we live, do you think that we are not very thoughtful, not especially reflective, not really taking the time to think through and to process what we are receiving and what we're taking in. Here, here's a third thought that I think is really the, the major point of the parable. Action is not an option. So again, knowledge for the sake of knowledge, that's not going to cut it. That's really building without a foundation. So action is not an option. Kirk's going to come up and lead us in an imitation song. And I want to say this from the heart. As we think about this parable in Luke chapter 6, 46 through 49, there is a message for every single one of us. And so, therefore, there is a fitting invitation for every single one of us present this morning. So, what kind of foundation are you building your life on today? So, for our honored guests this morning, we'll have a couple of opportunities for an invitation. One of the shepherds and I will be standing down front to receive you. And additionally, to my right, there's a room back over here. And a couple of our shepherds will be back there that would welcome you and could, could meet with you and pray with you if you would so desire in a little more private context, and that gives us a couple of opportunities to respond to our invitation. Kirk will lead us this morning. Let's stand and sing. God.